still in a battle to some degree, each and every day I think Christians are in the battle. We forget that a lot of times that we are in a battle. So our life is going to be hard, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be unpleasant at times, but um, keep on the fire line. There's victory. So let's stand and sing, keep on the fire line. <laughs>
Um, Lori just brought me this. I read it before, but I wanted to share it with you. It's called Wake Up America. Um, John Gatlin wrote it. He said, in three short months, just like he did with the plagues of Egypt, God has taken away everything we worship. God, you said, you want to worship athletics? God said, you want to worship athletics? I'll shut down the stadiums. You want to worship musicians? I'll shut down the civic centers. You want to worship actors? I'll shut down the theaters. You want to worship money? I'll shut your, get down the economy and collapse the stock market. If you don't want to go to church and worship me, I will make it where you can't go to church. My people call by my name when I'm on this and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then we'll argue from heaven. We'll forgive their sin and we'll heal their land. Maybe we don't need a vaccine. Maybe we need to take time from this isolation from the direct distractions of the world and have a personal revival where we focus on the only thing in this world that really matters, Jesus Christ. And that's true. He took away everything that we have been forced to. Now, that being said, we have observed the government shut down the United States of America almost for a virus. Um, next week, Tabernacle Baptist Church will not return to the new norm. We will return to normal. Amen. Amen. All the seats will be out. Uh, we will back to normal. Sunday school, we will have uh, next Sunday, we'll have our Wednesday night service, first Wednesday night service this Wednesday. We will have small group studies next Sunday at 9 30, and then we'll have our worship service at 10 30. I watched last night the late news, and I got thinking about it, and I thought, it's amazing to me that the government can shut down the United States of America for a virus, but they can't stop looters and murders and robbers from destroying cities. And I noticed there was no social distancing, distancing between those. I noticed that most of them were not wearing masks. So apparently, the coronavirus is not bad. Not affecting that many people in that case. I guess it only affects you if you come to church or something like that. Uh, or so try to go to work. Huh? Or try to go to work. Or try to go to work. Yeah, that's the only time it's bothered me. So this is going out of their ways. Next week, Tabernacle Baptist Church will be back to normal services. So, there it is. All right, let's see if you
I do want to add a footnote to what I said earlier. We're going to look back to the norm next Sunday. But I will caution everyone, especially those listening on the, the internet by way of streaming. Um, you know, if you have medical conditions or you are susceptible, in other words, use good common sense. Amen? Just like right now, Sister Carol's going to have surgery, I think, tomorrow. Okay, she's scheduled. So she's taking precautions, and that's good. That's what you should do. So if you have an underlying condition, and, and still exercise caution. You know, if we practice during the flu season what we've done during this virus season, we wouldn't have much flu. Washing your hands is a good idea. <laughs> and taking care. So with that being said, let everybody know you're glad to see them at Tabernacle Baptist Church this morning. Yeah.
this hip. Um, a week from tomorrow, I can go get another steroid shot. I one of every three months. They last about six weeks. But, <laughs> so I get to get another one week from tomorrow. And I was scared. I was supposed to have surgery. I had a hip replacement, but that got pushed back because of the coronavirus. So I called him the other day and asked him, I said, any idea where you're going to have surgery? Because I can't have surgery for three months after I have a shot. And uh, she said, well, no idea now. She said, looks like maybe the first year. She said, we'll probably get it before the rapture. I said, you better hurry up because that's about to take place. <laughs> Amen. I believe that with all my heart. The rapture's right around the corner. I may not have to have it. Uh, Carol, you may not get the surgery tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter number 10. I want to continue in a series of studies of messages I've got from um, Pastor Dan in Texas on David Dykes. Um, and on Daniel, we're looking through the book of Daniel. Um, and today is, I think I've got three more messages in there from Daniel. Today is prayer is spiritual warfare. It goes along with what we've been talking about this morning. Christ is all I need because I can go to him in prayer when I stand in need of anything. Uh, Daniel chapter number 10. Christian humorist, how many of you ever go to Dennis Swanberg? Have you ever heard of Dennis Swanberg? Funny Christian comedian. Uh, he tells the story of an unforgettable baptism that took place in a West Texas church. He said they were building a new sanctuary, and it was not all, it was almost finished, not quite done. The new baptistry had become functional, but they didn't have the changing room to build yet. But the pastor was so excited, he, he planned a baptism in the new baptistry. So, since they didn't have pews, they set up some folding chairs, uh, and the whole congregation gathered in and didn't have, like I said, didn't have changing rooms. So they, they put up some uh, blankets and curtains to make changing rooms. Everything went well until the last person to be baptized made her way down to the water. She was terrified of the water, but uh, they had been, she'd been assured that there's no reason for concern. But just as she got to the water, she panicked. <laughs> and the pastor went to, went to take her into the baptismal pool, and she panicked, and before being lowered in the water, she was clawing for air with everything she could guess. So guess what she grabbed a hold of? She grabbed a hold of one of those chain curtains that were making the changing room. Pulled that curtain down, and all of a sudden, there was a man standing there in nothing but his underwear. <laughs> And he was looking at the congregation was gentry at him like, oh no. And so he did the only thing he could do. He grabbed hold of the pastor and both of them died into the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> this one of said they dismissed the service quickly after that. <laughs> so what's the point in that story? Well, the, the tenth chapter of Daniel, the curtain is pulled aside. And you look at a, a, a one of the, one of the greatest visions I think ever given in the Bible for, 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 for Daniel. Um, it starts out in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. A message was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belshazzar. The message was true and it was about a great conflict. And he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. And by this time, Daniel is a very old man. And, and, uh, and he's well into his 80s. He's been retired from government for a while. But uh, even at his best age, he's still spiritually active, just like he was when he was a teen. The vision and the prophecy that Daniel received here covers three chapters, the last three chapters of the book of Daniel. And this is one of the longest and most complete prophecies, I think, in the entire book. Uh, today, we'll introduce, I'll introduce the vision to you, and we'll talk about it in chapters 11 and 12. But I'm dividing it into two parts. The first part begins in Daniel chapter 10, verse number 2. Stand, if you will, for the reading of God's Word. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three full weeks, I did not eat any rich food, no meat or wine entered my mouth, and I didn't put any oil in my body until the three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river of the Tigris, I looked up and there was a man dressed in linen with a belt of gold from, up, from Ephaz around his waist. His body was like topaz. His face was like the brilliance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze. And the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. Only I, Daniel, saw the vision. The men who were with me did not see it, but a great terror fell on them, and they ran and hid. I was left alone, looking at this great vision. No strength was left in me. My face grew deathly pale, and I was powerless. I heard the words he said, and when I heard them, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessing of it and the privilege we have to be in your house this morning. I ask God that you just Open our hearts and minds now. Help us to be receptive to your word. 
Lord, help us to learn what you have for us this morning. Again, I pray, Lord, if there's one listening and the sound of my voice that's not saved, today they would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I do believe that all these prophecies are being fulfilled. Lord, and the time is at hand that you will return us soon. I believe you will return us imminent. Lord, may we all be ready should that trumpet sound today and the rapture take place. Have your will away in this message. Help me to get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit preach. God, I'll give you all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory for this year. We're here today to glorify you above all others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So the first thing I want to talk to you about is the majesty of Jesus. Just how glorious he is in this vision. Now, uh, who was this person he saw? Most Bible scholars agree that this is one of those, what we call the Christophany. It's a pre-incarnate Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ, as we've seen before in the book of Daniel. The entire point of the prophecy here is to present a clear picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are a lot of prophecy, I call them prophecy judges. Um, they read the Bible and find details of, of, uh, of the future so they can create a new chart. Uh, somebody said, Lord, can't come back yet. It's not on my chart. <laughs> I'll tell you what. You might, yeah. He might disrupt your chart, and my chart as well. It's, it's not about making charts. The more you study prophecy, the more you see the pinnacle of prophecy is Jesus Christ. Everything points to Jesus Christ. Don't forget the book in our Bible, the last book in the Bible, people call it Revelations. It's not Revelation. It is the Revelation. As a matter of fact, chapter 1, verse 1 says, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. It is singular. Listen. We've seen this before. This is not the first time Daniel was exposed to Jesus. In, in chapter 2, Jesus was a stone that was not cut by human hands. It crushed the kingdoms of this world. In chapter number 7, he was the son of man who was given an everlasting kingdom. In chapter number 8, he was called the prince of princes who came to come to defeat the Antichrist. Chapter 9, he's called the anointed one who will be cut off after 483 years after the decree went forth. Remember we talked about the 77s uh, last time we were in some prophetic or some the stopwatch is on hold right now, waiting for that 70th week to start with the rapture. And even in chapter 4, Daniel writes about the fourth man in the fire who walked in, the, in, the, uh, in there with the three, with three Hebrew Christians. And we said that was a pre, uh, pre-incarnate Christ, a uh, Christophany. The entire Bible is all about Jesus. From, from Genesis right on through the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's about Jesus himself. Especially the Old Testament. If you read the Old Testament and don't see Jesus, you need to read it again because you missed something. All right? Daniel was busy in a place here on the Tigris River, had some with some other men, and he looked up and standing before him was the most breathtaking sight he had ever seen. Just think about it. It's a picture of the glorified, majestic Jesus Christ. It's the same that the three disciples saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. Daniel got to see this. And he saw him in all of his glory. It was like Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus going to persecute Christians and take them back to Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, a bright light was shining and he was stricken. And by the fact, blinded. And he saw that. He saw the glory of Jesus. And suddenly that bright light shined and he fell to the ground. The men who were with him didn't see it, just like the men who were with Daniel didn't see his vision. But all they did, they heard the sound of the voice speaking. And of course, there's a way to... Some people, <laughs> I like what Charles Spurgeon said. Some people try to explain away uh, Paul's conversion on the master Spurgeon. They said he had an epileptic seizure. <laughs> and Charles Spurgeon said, oh, that all of London should have an epileptic seizure. Amen? Uh, he saw the risen, he saw Christ. Listen, listen, the same happened here with Daniel. Daniel was alone, he saw this vision, the man with him were not granted that sight, they were overwhelmed with awe, and they ran away. But they didn't get to see it. John received, listen, John received the same thing on the Isle of Patmos. This is what, what the book of Revelation says in chapter 1, verse 13. And among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a long robe with a gold sash wrapped around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, white as snow. His eyes were fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as his fire in the furnace. And his voice was like the sound of cascading water. Sounds like the same person, doesn't it? Daniel got a chance to see him. Paul, John, and Daniel all had the same reaction when they saw Jesus Christ. What did they do? Fell to the ground. Face down upon the ground. They fell. I, I like that. Paul fell to the ground, blinded by the intensity of the light. Apostle John saw, he said, when I saw him, I fell. And his feet was a dead man. In verse 8 and 9, Daniel said, described how he became weak and collapsed to the ground, falling down face first. Let me assure you, 
Listen carefully. If you see Jesus face to face, and we will one day, I believe the first thing you're going to do is fall down in, in his awe and glory. John McCarthy tells a story before he Sunday after church. He said, somebody came up to him and was telling him, he said, you know, Jesus comes to me all the time. I see him all the time. He talks with me all the time. And John McCarthy was a little taken aback by that, so he asked him a question. He said, uh, he said, matter of fact, he said, of the morning when I'm shaving, Jesus comes and talks with me. And John said, let me ask you this. When Jesus comes to talk with you and you're shaving, do you quit shaving? He said, well, no. He said, I doubt you ever saw Jesus then. Amen? Because he said, you fall down in his presence. And that's exactly I mean, what, what's going to happen. In the Bible, when God appeared to the prophets and the apostles, it was utterly devastating to them. Can you imagine what it would be like if the Son of God walked into that door right now? With all his radiance, all his brilliance, all his glory, all his majesty. All I could see, I could see those doors open up. Did you see him come in? What we all fall flat on our face. We couldn't stand in his presence. Think about this description of it. Turn your eyes, look upon Jesus as he comes in the door. The clothing speaks of the royalty, his linen, the pure, holy, purity and holiness of Jesus Christ. In ancient times, only kings wore a golden sash. So here comes the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. His body is beautiful beyond description. One version calls his body crystal like it. The King James Version calls it, says beryl. The word, the Hebrew word there is describing a very, very precious stone that came from only one place on the earth, modern day Spain. And it was more valuable than diamonds. That's a precious stone. That's not like the body of Christ. Face revealed his radiance. His face was shining. John, the first John 1 5 says, God is light and there's absolutely no darkness in him. You know, darkness cannot overcome light, but light can overcome darkness. Every time, light can overcome darkness. I like that. The next is when Moses is exposed to the, the uh, afterglow of our God as he walks by, he comes down like a mountain with a shining face. Probably looked like he had been a sunburn of a different color. His hair was white. His eyes, he describes his eyes, they burn through any pretense. The eyes of Jesus were like flaming torches. They burn right through you. Can you imagine him walking through that door and gazing at you, just looking intently into your heart? There, when Jesus told Peter, You will deny me three times when the cock rose. And Peter denied him the third time. He said, Then the Lord turned, when the cock rose, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. How do you think that was? Fierceness, burning intensity of eyes. You talk about a look that burned Peter's heart. In that moment, a fire, fiery heart gazed at Jesus. Went all the way to his soul. That's why he went out and wept bitterly. He can see the very depths of your heart today. He said, I know who you are. Look at me. I know what you're doing. I even know what you contemplate doing. I know what you're thinking about. That's my king. That's my Lord. His arms are strong to comfort. His arms are described as burnished bronze. That speaks of strength. And I love the picture when Jesus called the little children to himself and took them up in those strong arms. And the Bible said he picked them up in the same arms that created the heavens and the universe. Those arms grew strong from working in a carpenter's shop. Actually, thank you for that song. He is the master of the world. He's the master of everything. What strength, what tenderness. Those same arms that's created everything, they call out to you. The strength of those arms say, come, let me wrap you in my arms and you. Comfort you. And give you a peace that passes all understanding. Man, I wish that door would open. Mm. You know what you need today? You need somebody to give you arms of love just encircle you. 
He said, let the children come to me, let the teenagers come to me, let the young people come to me, let the baby boomers, let the senior adults, all the more take us senior adults. We need you. We need your help. Body parts are wearing out. Have to be placed with invitations. Get to heaven, I won't need a hip replacement. Yeah, Lord, I need your strength. I need your grace, I need your mercy, I need your strength. Defeat and enable him to walk over danger. Bronze talks about the durability and protection. Those are a lot, there are a lot of places where it's dangerous to walk, but if your feet are bronze, it's no problem. That fresh little bread baby of mine, <laughs> uh, Amanda said, um, no, I said hers is more precious. <laughs> we'll debate that later. <laughs> but uh, she's got feet as tough as nails. Has to be. Gravel rocks. Don't slow her down a bit. She just runs right on over gravel rocks. The only thing that bothers she calls them prickles. <laughs> Sandsport uh, type thing. But she'll walk, I mean, she and snow on the ground, she'll grab her uh, And I think about Jesus. They described his feet as bronze. Nothing could hurt him. He was what? Those feet walked on the water. But they walked in, down the dusty roads of Galilee and they walked up to Del Rosa to Calvary's cross. Ephesians 1 22 says, He put everything under his feet. So don't be afraid. If you're walking with Jesus, you'll always be safe because his feet can take you anywhere. And his voice has said, voice is too loud to ignore. Daniel described his voice, he says, like the sound of a multitude. Have you ever been in a stadium, when a, in a, a, a special football stadium or basketball um, arena, when the team scores and everybody hollers, the decibel level goes off the roof, and everybody's just screaming. It's like a deafening roar. That's what he's talking about here. That's the sound of his voice. God sometimes speaks us in still small voice, but the voice of glorified God, exalted Christ, exalted Christ is louder than a hundred jetliners taking off. And that's noise, folks. Think about what comes from the lips of Jesus. Jesus said first things no other person could say. Can you imagine Plato, Moses, Aristotle, or Albert Einstein today and saying, Come unto me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest? <laughs> They never, Boogie never said anything like that. Muhammad never said anything. All that is from the lips of Jesus. Those who study religion would never expect these others to say something like that. But for Jesus, it makes sense. The, Daniel, the prophet Daniel was being prepared to learn some remarkable things. You're going to see those in chapter 11 and chapter 12. But in verse number 10, he said, Suddenly a hand touched me and raised me to my hands and knees. He said to me, Daniel, you're a man treasured by God. Understand the words that I'm saying to you. Stand on your feet, for I have now been sent to you. After he said this to me, I stood trembling. Now we believe this is being this is being his angel of Gabriel. He said, You're a treasure. Gabriel visited in verse 12. Don't be afraid, Daniel. He said to me, For from the first day that you purposed to understand and to humble yourselves before your God, your prayers were heard. I have come because of your prayers. I have come because of your prayer, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days. And we're not talking about a human prince here, but a fallen angel, a demon. Then Michael, one of the, one of the chief princes, came to me after I had been left there with the kings of Persia. An archangel, or an angel, Michael, came and he said, Now I have come to help you understand what will happen to your people. And to the last days, the vision refers to those days. Verse 20, he said, you know why I've come to you? I must return at once to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I leave, the prince of Greece will come. No one has courage to support me against them except Michael, your prince. However, I will tell you what is recorded in the book of truth. Listen, no one supports me more than Michael, the angel. Listen, that's Daniel chapter 10, verse 20. Now, that's the description of my majestic Christ. Can you picture him walking in like that? What would you do? That's the song I can only imagine. I think I don't have to imagine that. Will I be able to speak at all? No. No, I don't think so. The only thing I can do is follow you. All that majestic glory, splendor, all
all the adoration we can lay upon him, the best description we can give him cannot describe him. All we're going to do is see how merciful he's been to us. How gracious he's been. That's the mystery of prayer, number two. The key to victory is spiritual warfare, and folks, we are involved in spiritual warfare today. I've said that before. Last week I preached the ten general orders of the church. Well, Jerry, I took it from the ten, from the eleven general orders. I took it from the eleven general orders of the Navy and made it try to adapt it to the general orders of the church. I'm thinking the church needs to be at work. We need to be about the Lord's work. And the greatest thing we can do, the greatest thing we can do is pray. We can be a praying church. This church needs to be a praying church. Every church needs to be a praying church. I want us to consider that for just a few minutes, the mystery of prayer. These few verses pull aside that veil and let you see, catch a glimpse of what takes place behind the scenes of the world, the physical world. There's a war going on that we cannot see. It is a spiritual warfare. The angels, somebody said, if, if God would reveal what's happening in, in the spiritual realm, it would scare us to death. There are demons all around us battling the angels of God, and the angels of God are there for our protection. Angels are a fascinating topic, and there's, not, and there's so much ignorance about them out there. The Bible teaches us in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation? There are thousands mm -hmm. of angel stories, and people believe God sent an angel to protect them. During World War II, soldiers were given Bibles to put in their first in, in their front pocket. And those Bibles were they were New Testaments. I've had, I had my brothers, or I did have it, my nephew may have it now, but in him, the front of the cover, the front cover was made of brass. And Lexi showed me his when he gave it to me, it had a bullet mark where it was hit. But it was put in your protection. You know, and he wrote in there, he wrote on the, the flyleaf of his Bible, that, you know, that Psalm 1 to 9 11, for he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways. We think in an ordinary coincidence, oftentimes there are miracles and ministries of angels. What takes place in our life? Many times, I believe, are ministries of the, of the angels protecting us. You ever wonder why you left the house in such a hurry? You had to be someplace, and you got in the car, and you drove about five miles down the road, and you realized that important piece of paper that you had to take to that appointment was still back at the house. And you had to turn around and drive back to the house. And when you got there, you remember, I put it there. I didn't see it, but it's there now. And you picked it up and wondered, how could I miss that? And you drove down the road, and there was an accident, a very bad automobile accident. Maybe an angel just took that thing and slid it under the corner so that you wouldn't see it. You see, people, we talk about coincidence. Now, yeah, and it could have been a coincidence. It could. It could have been a ministry angel protecting you, too. So you wouldn't thank God. Think about what the angel would do for you. God sent his angel to Daniel to do two things. The first thing he was to comfort and reassure him. What's the first thing he said? Don't be afraid. Angels say, don't be afraid. Number one message. Number one message. If this was family feud, that would be the number one answer. What do the angels say? Don't be afraid. That's the number one thing. They come to comfort us. And they came to comfort Daniel. In that message you need to hear from God today, don't be afraid. Something bothering you, faith and fear cannot reside in the same heart and mind at the same moment. You cannot have faith and fear at the same time. Now, there is godly fear, and there is protective fear, but there's also faith. Faith and fear cannot, faith and ungodly fear cannot operate in the same heart. Now, I fear a back truck, I'm not going to run out there in front of it. But I'm not going to be afraid to get the car and drive because of the one on the road. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to put my faith in God. The second thing the angel came was to deliver an answer to Daniel's prayer. In the process, we learned some things about the mystery of prayer, and I'll go through these quickly. Because you can go to the buffet today, can't you? Is that right? They open. You can, I think, 25% capacity or something like that. If you can get in, that's right. <laughs> 
Some important facts about prayer. Powerful, powerful, powerful prayer has these characteristics. First, it starts with a burden. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three, four weeks. I didn't eat any rich food, no meat or wine into my mouth, I didn't put any oil in my body. Until the three weeks were over, he was burdened for three weeks. He's so burdened, he begins to sin fast. Stops eating meat, drinking wine, he stops using lotion to soothe his body from the burning heat. Why is he burdened? Well, according to the timing of this vision, the Jews have, have, should have been started going back to Jerusalem to repopulate Israel. And history tells us that many of them were so accustomed to the Persian lifestyle, they didn't want to leave. The entire book of Esther describes the Jews in Persia after they were given the right to return to their homeland. They had been told, you can go back to your homeland, yet they stayed. The whole entire book of Esther is written during that time frame. And Daniel was so burdened over his people, the Jews, that should have gone back, and they fallen in love with the wrong world. Let me ask you something. Are you really burdened for the moral decay that exists in America today? I'm talking about being burdened. I'm not talking about being sad. I think we're all, listen to me, too many in the church are just saddened about it. We ought to be burdened about it. And folks, what happened in Minneapolis was an atrocity. There's no doubt about that. You know, that's not even, I know, Luke Robinson was a policeman. Talking with him, that's not an accepted move to put your knee on somebody's neck. That's not even a proper move. That's not an approved tactic. That's terrible. And racism is alive and well in America still. I know that. But also, I'm going to tell you something. When you start robbing and looting and murdering people and burning stores and wrecking things, it's no longer about that. It's about you and your greed. You're no better than Exactly. No better. Listen, we need to be burdened over this stuff. I'm talking about the point where we cry out to God. Maybe we even fast like Daniel did here. <laughs> American dream has fast become the American nightmare. And don't tell me you're burdened until you start doing like that. Until we start really, I'm talking about praying like our lives depending upon it. Too many of us are burdened because Christians are in love with the godless culture around us. Daniel fast, fasted and prayed for three weeks. Would you ever consider doing the same thing? Number two, prayer doesn't stop until it Powerful prayer doesn't stop until an answer comes. Verse 12, don't be afraid, Daniel. He said to me, well, from the very first day that you proposed to understand and own yourself before God, your prayers were heard, and I have come because of your prayers. He was there because Daniel prayed and kept praying. Daniel doesn't just pray once and says, now forget it. He said, he doesn't say, now I've done my duty, I prayed about this thing. He humbles himself before God in his heavy spirit. He mourns for three weeks and prays. However, the answer had not yet come. So he kept on praying for three weeks. Give me understanding, he said. Nothing's coming. He prayed, knocking at heaven's door for three weeks. He petitioned God, wrestling with him in prayer, agonizing, weeping, waiting. Daniel experienced a delay. <laughs> not because God wasn't answering his prayer. Because Satan is hindering. And Satan had sent a, a demon, a demon of Persia. If Daniel's persistent prayer had not outlasted this period of delay, he wouldn't have been defeated. But see, the whole time he was praying, there was a battle going on. He said, from the very first time he prayed, it was answered. But there was a battle going on. And he didn't, Daniel didn't know it. If he quit praying, he'd never got the victory. Sometimes we quit praying too soon. There's a message I preach every once in a while called you need to keep at your purpose. Too quickly. Almost time to pick the peas. And you leave before you get right. Amen. Sometimes we do that. Matthew 7 7 says, keep asking. It, it should be translated this way. It should be because it, it's persistent. It says, keep asking, it will be given to you. Keep searching, it will be given to you. Keep knocking, and the door will be opened to you. Keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. Is there some area in your life where you can stop praying because you haven't gotten an answer? Yes. Why did you stop praying? How do you know that God's answer to your prayer wasn't being hindered while they fought a battle to deliver it to you? You prayed for that troubled child. And you prayed for that troubled child. 
But you got to the point where you just stopped praying because you didn't think the answer was coming. And the whole time God was getting somebody ready to deliver the gospel to him. But Satan was provincially and was trying to hinder him from doing that. I'm trying to get you to think about what prayer means today. How, how prayer is spirit, very spiritual warfare. That's what it is. It's warfare. It's not something we do just to appease God. It is spiritual warfare. It is battle. It is the toughest battle you will ever fight. Let me tell you something. The devil will let you read your Bible. He will let you come to church. He will let you do certain things. But when you get on your knees and start praying, he's going to fight you. With everything you got, everything he's got, all of a sudden, how many, how many of you have been praying? And, and I mean, you, you were getting down to, you were really going to pray earnestly, and you started to pray, and you said, Did I turn that up and off? Where do you think that comes from? He will hinder you. Prayer is resisted. Number three, it's often resisted by Satan's soldiers. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I, after I'd been there, left with the kings. There are reasons why our prayers are going to be delayed. The battle of prayer takes place. Let me say something. Just as there was, I, just as there was a prince of Persia, a demon, I'm convinced there's a prince of America today. I'm convinced there's a demon in charge of America. He devoted much of his, uh, our attention to our his attention to our political leaders in Washington. And there I say wrong. Yeah, I think I'm I believe there's a French of Russia. I believe there's a French of China. I believe there's a French for every country. And one for every city. That's why God said in Ephesians 6, put on the floor of our God so you can stand against the tactics of the devil. For our God is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert in this with all prayer spirits and in in intercession for all the saints. Dr. Peter Wagner, in his book, How to Fight and Defeat Ter Territorial Spirits, he says that in the 21st century, the Holy Spirit is calling the church to a spiritual warfare. Wind, territorial spirits, evil spirits, demons, principalities, powers. That's what you're fighting against. John Piper wrote this, and I'm quoting. He said, the New Testament tells us that this prince of demons darkens the minds of unbelievers, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that he deceives the world, Revelation 12, 9, and that he plants his sweeps, unbelievers, throughout the world, Matthew 13, 39, and that he takes people captive to do his will, 2 Timothy 2, 25, and that he plucks up the seed of the word, when it's preached in Matthew 13, 4. And since we know the Prince of Demons does all of this, we conclude that, you know, that's why sub princes do as well. Daniel 10 makes it clear that there is a spiritual warfare. It's reality. We read about the incredible atrocities of Hitler, Stalin, leaders of the Bosnia Serbian conflict. You can't escape the fact that there's a devil who's been on the destruction of the human race. Satan's ruined everything he's ever touched. And he'll wreck your life if you don't resist it. Thank God God's greater. John 1 John 4, 4 says, one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. I'm not one to see demons behind every tree. And I'm not like some people when every time they hear a sneeze, they rebuke the demon and sneeze it. Or every time they hit it, they rebuke the demon and hit it. I'm not like that. But I'm convinced there's an invisible world of spiritual conflict. How many of you have ever read uh, C.S. Lewis's great book, Screw Tape Letters? Great book. If you haven't read it, let me recommend Screw Tape Letters to you. I like C.S. Lewis anyway. But in it, Lewis proposes the idea that there's a person, you know, every person has a demon assigned to them. And the book contains letters from the senior devil, Screw Tape, written to a young novice named Wormwood. And he tells him how to tempt his person that he's been assigned to, and how to, how to, first of all, tells him how to keep him from being saved, and then he tells him how to tempt him after he's being saved. In one section, Screw Tape writes, and I'm quoting, the fact that devils are predominantly common figures, common figures in the modern imagination will help you. If any faint suggestion of existence begins to rise in your mind, 
suggest to him a picture of something in red tights and persuade him that since he cannot believe in that, he therefore cannot believe in you. I hope that's what we really do. You never really screw take those big copy off, really. You enjoy it. Satan and his demons don't want you to recognize their existence. I've said it before. If Satan came to you with pointing to it, or with pointing on his head, a pitchfork, a pointed tail, and a red suit, you would. Satan won't come to you like that. He's going to come to you as an angel of light. He's going to come something to him, something to you that's attractive to you, especially to your flesh and nature, to the lust of your flesh, to the pride of your life, the lust of your eyes. He's going to come like that. The devil is not omniscient. He doesn't know how to fight. But he does know how to organize. And he is very highly organized. Demons do not like dogs that loose their partition butterflies. They're given assignments. Number four, prayer is our strategic weapon to get a second. That's our weapon. He said, Do you know why I come to you? I must return at once to fight against the Prince of Persia. When I leave, the Prince of Greece will come. If you ever want to be victorious in the Christian life, you've got to learn this dynamic truth about prayer. The struggle, the spiritual struggle, is a glimpse that we get in this chapter, in this chapter is real. It continues to this day. Satan is fighting every prayer that you try to send up. Satan fights that prayer. Sometimes people say, don't seem like God's hearing my prayer. And you let Satan fight it. Just because God doesn't answer the way you want him to answer doesn't mean he hasn't heard your prayer. Could be Satan is trying to hinder that prayer. Hinder his answer to your prayer. And keep it from coming down. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 says, Since the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but are powerful through God to demolish the stronghold, we demolish arguments. Every high-minded thing is raised up against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to obey Christ, to the obedience of Christ. The military, that's a military word, being a fortress, referring to an area where the enemy is entrenched. Talking about the stronghold. The enemy's been set up there, the devil's set up. People, we have strong, he set up strongholds in our lives. There are places in our lives that we give in to him and let him establish his stronghold. Now it starts out, he's just digging a little trench. Oh, I walked all over his battlefields and I saw the entrenchments and the, the Union forces and the Confederate forces dug. Of course, they're not that high now, but they were, they were as high as four feet, those entrenchments. And I thought about this message. I thought about God's, that's the way Satan starts in our life. He starts digging a little entrenchment. And after a while, he set up a stronghold. And we can, listen, we cannot overcome that stronghold in and on ourselves, but by the power of Almighty God and through prayer, we can. I don't care whether it's addiction, whether it's not, whatever it is, God, God can overcome that stronghold. But it has to be when you fought with prayer. It will not be fought with your will. You will not will yourself and say, I'm going to overcome this. I'm able to overcome this. No, it is by the power of God only that you can overcome this. These strongholds. In Exodus 17, you know, Joshua led the army against the Israelites, against the Malachites down in the Valley of Rephidim. And meanwhile, Moses positioned himself in the mountain. And as, as, as long as Moses' hands were lifted up in prayer, the Israelites prevailed. When his arms fell, <laughs> they and a Malachite prevailed. So he had Aaron, his brother, standing at one, one side of him, and, and others holding up his arm, and soon the Israelite army was back in the battle again. Now let me ask you something. Was the battle really being fought in, in the battle? Listen, listen carefully. Was the battle, battle really being fought in the Valley of Rephidim between the Malachites and the Israelites? No, it was being fought on that mountaintop as God and Moses raised his hand to God in prayer. That's where the battle was being fought. That's why when his hands fell, the praying wasn't as intense. And the Malachites prevailed. And he his hands back up. And Israel prevailed. Folks, you have, we have to be a praying people. Prayer is essential. It is spiritual warfare. Prayer is where the real battle takes place. When we get up off our knees, then we go out to enjoy. That's when you go out and enjoy the spoils of, of war. The war is fought on your knees. The battle is the spoil of war where you get the victory. 
Let that sink in for just a minute. I want to say that again. The battle is actually fought when you need to pray. Then you get up and get the victory. Amen. I'm closing. I know I've been a little longer today. In 1990, Saddam Hussein entered the small country of Kuwait, and they captured. And I don't think he was quite prepared for the unified response that he got him to do that. Coalition forces were led by Jordan General Norman Schwarzkopf. Then it began the Gulf War. Saddam had a great army. Matter of fact, they said it was the fifth largest army in the world. And he had predicted his army would be victorious and would be the bad mother of all battles. Well, <laughs> the strategy of the coalition forces was let's make an aerial assault in magnitude, which the world's never seen before. They've never seen an aerial assault like this. Now, on the first night, stealth fighters slipped in in airspace and began bomb control and communication places. And uh, that opened the way for thousands of air sorties to be running in Iraq. We watched on television as sport bombs track your precision accuracy, could track, the, could track a license plate, and take out a car. After several weeks of the air assault, the ground operation began. History says that one time there was a hundred year war, and there's probably been a hundred, few hundred day wars. <laughs> but the Gulf War lasted 100 hours. The Iraqi soldiers literally ran towards the enemy with their hands up, surrendering. In sport, spiritual warfare, prayer is like the bombing campaign that sets the stage. As we bombard heaven with our prayers, victory is assured. <coughs> Come in this room wishes with me, wishes me to handle the Vietnam War the same way we handled the Gulf War. I do. What a difference that would have made. You see, the Vietnam War. Politicians running that made decisions based on their political ramifications. The philosophy of Gulf War was this. If we're going to fight this, we must win fast and avoid casualties. Some of my friends died in Vietnam. And I consider Vietnam veterans true heroes. I wish our country had taken the same strategy in that war and gone in there to win it. Here's my point. Prayer is warfare. Some of us, some of us have a Vietnam War strategy our prayer. We pray when we think you'll be effective. You struggle constantly and you win a battle, lose a battle here and there and you don't have any clear objectives when you pray. You haven't even identified who your enemy is. Your prayer life can be more like the Gulf War campaign. You can put on your own God and start praying. You can get a burden. You can keep on praying until you get an answer. Realize there is an enemy out there who is out to destroy you and wants to resist your prayers and start bombing these strongholds with the prayers of faith. That's when your prayer life will be effective in spiritual warfare. Folks, prayer is spiritual warfare. It's not just something we do to appease God and to make us feel better about ourselves. It is a spiritual warfare. Prayer is a necessity. To go to try to fight a battle without praying would be like going into war without any ammunition. We have to have a more intense prayer life. In five eyes closed for just a minute. So I want to do that. Let me ask you this in closing. How many of you know God was shouting out, Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Your word of testimony. Would you slip up your hand? Thank you. God bless you. I appreciate that. Those listening to streaming live, if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, let me tell you now. Jesus died that you might have forgiveness of your sin. Ask Him. Just say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, but I believe Jesus died for me. Come into my life. Change me, Lord. Forgive me of my sin for creating me a new heart. And ask Him in the name of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Who shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Christian, we know the Lord is our Savior. But the truth of the matter is, we have some strongholds in our life that have been set up. Or our prayer life is not as consistent. Our prayer life is not as intense as it should be. We need to recognize, Lord, I know I'm in a spiritual warfare right now. Lord, prayer is my spiritual warfare. Lord, I'm not in prayer as I should. 
Lord, straight, I come to you now asking you to strengthen my burden. Strengthen my burden, Lord, that I might kneel before you in a powerful prayer, a persistent prayer. Would you stand to your feet, please? Heavenly Father, I pray you have your word away in this invitation. May your children be responsive to your spirit. God, we need prayer. We need to be a praying church. We need to be a praying people. God, burden us today for the necessity of prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. As she begins to pray, God spoke to your heart. You come and ask God to do that for you today. You come right now. Come to on bending knees. Ask him to say, God, increase that word of your prayer life. It is spiritual warfare. It's where the battle is. That's true, and said.